Hi, what exactly is El Nino and how will it impact the weather and ecosystems in the Midwest? Welcome to the search bar. You've got questions? Let's find some answers. I'm your host, Adam Sparks, and today I'll be chatting with Zach Johnson, a climate scientist and meteorology professor here at Central Michigan University. Well, Zach, thanks for being here with me today. I yeah. pr appreciate you coming in to, to talk about the weather as good Midwesterners do. Today, we're going to start um, by trying to expand a little bit on um, our audience's understanding of what El Nino is. Now, what else should we know about El Nino and what it is other than it, it's Spanish for the Nino? Right, right. No, that's a great question. Um, well, originally, the terminology from El Nino came from... Uh, uh, folks in Peru and South America, where they noticed that the ocean was warmer in December. And so uh, they referred to this warming as El Nino de Navidad uh, mm -hmm. to refer to Christ because mm -hmm. it was in December. This uh, warming of the tropical Pacific, which uh, is adjacent to Peru and South America, uh, they noticed uh, that there was not as many fish being produced. So fishing became an issue. Uh, during an El Nino. And of course, obviously, as the field of climate science uh, became more prevalent, we, we now understand the physical mechanisms of El Nino. So El Nino really is, it's this warming of the tropical Pacific where we have warmer than average sea surface temperatures. And that in turn actually it, it impacts the uh, atmospheric circulation all over the globe, for instance. So we have this El Nino, which is warming of the tropical Pacific, but then sometimes it becomes cooler than average. And that's considered, uh, that's called an La Nina. And so that's kind of where the terminology came about. And this kind of back and forth between El Nino and La Nina takes about two to seven years to oscillate back and forth. And we call this the combined effect of El Nino and La Nina, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. This is coming from no scientist. The thing that I thought was kind of fascinating, or at least the way I kind of started to wrap my head around it, was imagining the thermal climate is kind of a teeter-totter that's kind of pointing towards Asia and then pointing towards the Americas, like depending on whether you're in El Nino or La Nina. Is that, am I? Yeah, you are, are spot on. So I, I didn't want to get into all the jargon let's uh, do about it. it, but let's, let's do, do it. it. Yeah, so uh, this thermal climate is this boundary in the ocean uh, about mm, maybe 300 feet deep in the tropical mm -hmm. Pacific, and it's the interface between the upper part of the ocean, which is well mixed by wind uh, and is warm, and then the deeper part of the ocean. And so when it's warmer, the thermocline is deeper. Mm -hmm. And when sea surface temperatures are cooler, the thermocline is shallower. And so, yeah, the uh, over this east-west, you know, thermocline, this boundary can tilt back and forth over the entire tropical Pacific. So it's this really large this really large scale phenomenon. And we're most interested uh, as, as climate scientists, how El Nino and La Nina impacts the upper ocean and the atmosphere. So yeah, it, we could get into the jargon and the physical mechanisms of El yeah. Nino. It, it, it gets really complicated really fast. It involves some pretty hardcore physics, uh, wave theory and whatnot. And so that also involves uh, complicated partial differential equations to describe this uh, warming and cooling patterns of the tropical Pacific. I mean, a big part of that too is trade winds, right? So yeah, I, I also, I've only ever heard the tr term trade wind. Could you explain what a trade wind is to a climate? Scientist? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so in the mid latitude where we live, we yeah. have winds coming from the west and going east. Mm -hmm. In the tropics, winds go from the east to the west. So we have uh, easterly winds. Uh, in the tropics. So the trade winds, they go from east to west uh, along the equator and uh, straddling the equator north and south. So for instance, in Hawaii, they have trade winds. In the Car Caribbean, there's trade winds. And so uh, these trade winds pull water in the tropical Pacific and they help pile water up in the western tropical Pacific. And so this water gets to travel across the entirety of the tropical Pacific, warming from the sun. And so the Western tropical Pacific is really warm and warm waters. If you're a meteorologist or a climate scientist, warm waters induce lower sea level pressure. So we have low pressure in the Western tropical Pacific. And then those cooler waters in the Eastern tropical Pacific are relatively, um, they're relatively colder than the Western tropical Pacific. And that induces high pressure. 
So you have this difference between high pressure and low pressure across the entirety of the Pacific, and that induces wind. So we have easterlies in the tropical Pacific. So when uh, we have an El Nino, the trade winds weaken, right? right? So those winds that are coming from east to west, they're not as strong. And that means that warm water that's been piled up in the western tropical Pacific can move eastward. And mm -hmm. that triggers the El Nino event, where this warm water in the western tropical Pacific uh, migrates to the east because the trade winds are weaker. And that in turn causes a positive sea surface temperature anomaly, right? Warmer yep. than average temperatures. And then that is the essence of El Nino. And then all of a sudden, we have a change in the atmospheric circulations. And that warming of the tropical Pacific can, can, can alter weather and climate patterns all around the world. I like to always, uh, when I'm trying to decipher between weather and climate, I like to think of weather as your mood and climate as personality, right? Mm -hmm. Your mood changes from day to day. Uh, sometimes you're in a good mood, sometimes you're in a bad mood. Bad mood. That's, that's human behavior. But your personality is, is something that sticks with you uh, throughout your lifetime. So mm -hmm. climate really is this much, much longer term concept compared to weather, where weather changes from day to day, week to week. Climate, we're, we're thinking on decades, we're thinking on centuries. So I really like that that idea. So let's talk about the impact of El Nino. Are we, we're going into an El Nino year, right? Twenty twenty four is going to be. What are those Peruvian fishermen seeing? Because those are the, those are kind of you know they named it. Well, how does that? What happens there? And then as it comes over to say us in the Midwest, what can we expect to see? Right. I mean, there's so many angles to look at this. There's ecosystem impacts, which I think the Peruvian fishermen were seeing, right? If we cause warmer sea surface temperatures, uh, maybe there's going to be more algae blooms or plankton. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. the fish can feed on it or, or something like that. And that's what the Peruvian fishermen were, were dealing with. For us here in the Midwest, why do we care about El Nino? Why do we care about something that's thousands of miles away? Well, like I said, El Nino causes a change in the atmospheric circulation. And that change can propagate to us here in Michigan. And so El Nino typically favors a, uh, a change in the jet stream, uh, a northward or southward migration of the jet stream. And so here in Michigan, because of this climate phenomenon in the tropical Pacific, it induces this change in the jet stream. And that is going to cause uh, typically warmer, it favors warmer winters here in, in Michigan and a less precipitation. So yeah, we're, we are going into this El Nino pattern usually peaks in uh, December and January, which is why the uh, Peruvian fishermen uh, realize this phenomenon. And so we see the greatest impact in the winter here in the United States, including Michigan. I'm just trying to give people pictures too. I think, again, correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm probably way oversimplifying this, <laughs> but it depends on what side of that jet stream you're on too, as that comes in, right? Like you're going to get, so the, there's a difference between where you're at in that jet stream and what kind of uh, weather phenomena you're going to see from El Nino, correct? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the jet stream is this this kind of river of storm systems, right? Mm -hmm. And so if the jet stream is further north, your storm systems are going to be further north. And also the jet stream separates really cold air in the Arctic mm -hmm. and northern Canada and warm tropical air in the southeastern United States or the southern part of the United States. So when this jet stream is migrated further north during an El Nino, that means we're going to have warmer weather. And if the storm systems are going to be further north, that means we're going to have less precipitation. So you kind of have this, this effect where, where here in the Midwest, we have less precipitation and warmer conditions. And, and so that, that usually occurs in the winter. We see mm -hmm. the greatest impact in the winter. And, you know, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out this winter. Are there things that people can expect to see as far as signs that, this, that, that, it's, that it's happening? I think. You know, sometimes I'm really trying to address this because I know that when I'm with biologists and climate scientists and geologists here, it seems like there's a lot of subtle things that are going on. And I think if you're just consuming this kind of on your morning news, it's easy to go, ugh, you call it. And I think that was kind of the old, that was the kind of the joke with Chris Farley. It's El Nino. And at the time in the 90s, when we really first started talking about it, at least that's when I remember hearing about it, so I can date myself, I was very young. We'd have a rainstorm that year. I think it was 97 or 98 was the year. It was really big. It was, it might've been 94. It was 97 was the greatest. It was the big one. Nino, that yeah. was the year. Okay. It was 97. I remember it would like rain and I was a kid and we'd be like, it's El Nino. <laughs> but like what really, 
what are signs that you might be seeing in your community that you are being affected by this phenomena? Right. It, it's really hard to see it from day to day. Yeah. So when we look at the weather forecast, it's, it's really hard to see it. But if we average all of the weather over the course of the winter, mm. we might be able to look back and say, oh, yeah, it was warmer than average. Yes, we had less precipitation than average. But when you look at it in terms of a weather time scale, you probably won't see it. We're still going to have heavy snow. We're still going to have cold snaps. We'll have warm periods, potent storms uh, this winter. But again, if you average all of the weather that happened this winter, you might be able to see the change at the end of the winter, not during the winter. Yeah, so it's not really, in, unless you're uh, one of these people who are on like uh, the, we the weather Facebook groups and stuff. Um, we have a guy in Michigan, I for forget his name, who's like, super famous for having he's not he's not a meteorologist i'm sure meteorologists <laughs> hate this but he's like a hobby weather guy who has like this ma these massive online communities sure. but unless you're in there you're likely to just go oh, two or three months later man it was, it was it was more rainy than snowy this winter you know yeah is there a preparedness that's necessary for this or for us here in the northern midwest is this more of just like a at least day to day, it's more of like an, an inconvenience if the weather is not what we are normally used to. Is there preparedness? Now, that's an interesting question. Uh, if you're interested in the long term, yes. Yeah. You might be able to say, wow, I'm not spending as much money on heating uh, this winter. Mm -hmm. That's you might be able to notice that in terms of day to day activities. No, you won't. You won't. I, I don't think you can prepare. We're still going to have snow here in Michigan. Mm -hmm. There just might not be as much of it. So depending on the way you look at it, like if you're interested in energy or winter sports, these are things that you care about long-term uh, changes. For instance, snowpack, right? Winter yeah. sports, they want snowpack. They want uh, ice for ice fishing. Folks in that, in those industries, they might notice and they need to take preparations. But your average person that cares about the weather day to day, I don't think you could really prepare for El Nino. But it's going to snow less. You heard it here. Zach said it's going to snow. If, it, if, it, if there's a lot of snow this year, um, we'll put Zach's email up um, in the YouTube video and on the uh, Spotify video. You can email him. Exactly. exactly. Not, not me. I think it's going to snow a lot. Uh, but I mean, and that, you might be right. That's true. <laughs> who knows? Well, I mean, we, you know, the thing about living uh, where we live, and there's other things going to affect that precipitation. Maybe not here in the middle of Michigan, but certainly Michigan is, is coastal. We have a lot of lake effects snow, and that's more weather than climate, mm -hmm. at least the day that it happens, right? It's not as predictable long term. Yeah, but, but you might think, you know, okay, there's a big lake, lake or snow lake effect pattern uh maybe you're in grand rapids and all of a sudden you have three feet of snow on the ground and you're like wow this doesn't really feel like an el nino yeah and locally in grand rapids you might see that it snowed more due to lake effect but i think if we average over the entire state of michigan when comes springtime you might see okay yeah we did have less snow than normal or the snow uh, pack that line was further north than normal because it was warmer than right. normal. From the perspective of someone who is uh, a faculty member and a researcher, like what's the, what's the value? What's the importance of making sure that things that this is both studied and, and taught? So here in Michigan, uh, in the in the Upper Midwest, the uh, impact of El Nino is actually quite a bit less than mm -hmm. a lot of places. So, for instance, during an El Nino, uh, Australia goes through crazy droughts and wildfires. I mean, that's been in the news in the past several years. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and for instance, uh, maybe in the Amazon, rainforest is highly impacted by El Nino and La Nina. California, for instance, is heavily impacted by El Nino and La Nina in terms of, uh, in terms of rainfall, right? And mm -hmm. out there, they're very sensitive to rainfall, right? They have major water resource issues. Here in Michigan, we don't have as great of an impact. In terms of studying this, it's, it's really important uh, for my research to, to understand uh, how El Nino forms. What are the physical mechanisms? That's kind of what I'm studying. And then I also try to improve its predictability, right? If we can predict El Nino on a longer time scale, then folks that are really susceptible to El Nino and La Nina, they mm. can prepare more. Here in Michigan, we don't have to do as much preparation because the impact of El Nino and La Nina is not as great compared to other places. There's yeah. this differential impact. <laughs> Although a lot of people who watch the, the news would tell you it's not. Like, weather is easy to predict, but climate events are not so much. There's, like you were talking about earlier, there's so many, even though we, climate science in the last 20, 30 years has gotten a lot, it, it's, the focus is there now. Like, there's more and more of it. 
we also have a, it's a harder to predict an event as big as El Nino, right? It's not as obvious until it's upon us, right? Yeah, we we as a climate scientists have this um we're, we're trying to improve the predictability of El Nino and mm. it's been actually a really immense challenge to improve the predictability of El Nino. There's this concept uh called the spring barrier and it's this idea that we can't really predict El Nino in the winter in the preceding spring or before that. Yeah. There's a six to nine month limit on predictability and uh, trying to overcome that, this concept, this abstract, co abstract concept of the spring barrier is, is really, really challenging. It's, it's something that a lot of folks in, in, in my field are trying to overcome. And so there's this kind of limit to predictability of, of, of El Nino and La Nina in terms of weather forecasting, I, I think uh, it, it is really challenging to, to forecast weather. We've, we've gotten good at it in the short term, but long term, when we're thinking upon weeks and greater, uh, we're start thinking about climate and El Nino and La Nina plays a huge role in those forecasts. Right. So I, I think understanding the physical mechanisms, why they occur, and trying to improve the predictability of El Nino and La Nina will, you know, it could be very beneficial to, to folks like you and I, but also uh, has really uh, huge implications on economies and industries too, that, that are reliant on, um, you know, changes of our environment. All right. So yeah, like in terms of things like winter sports, when you're talking about like having snowpack, not having to break the snow, making machines out, whether ice is safe for ice fishing. I mean, there's, that's just a few of the things that people are going to have a a big personal impact on potentially not just with this, but with bigger climate change, you know, globally. Yeah, no, there is a lot to talk about in terms of climate change. And I think one of the interesting questions in terms of El Nino and La Nina, El Nino is this warming of the tropical Pacific and mm. climate change, we are seeing warming. So the question becomes, will we see more El Nino impacts around the world uh, that we already see today with El Nino? in terms of climate change. And, you know, I, I think it, it's an interesting topic to, to touch on, especially its impacts. For instance, like you said, uh, maybe a change in uh, snowpack in Michigan that might impact winter sports. Mm. That also has uh, ecosystem impacts, right? If you change the amount of snowpack in Michigan, then all of a sudden you're altering maybe changes in lake level and things like that. If there's less ice coverage over Lake Michigan, then all of a sudden you change the amount of evaporation that occurs. And maybe in the future, lake levels might decrease. And so it really is an interesting topic to, to discuss the impact of climate change. That's awesome. And if you want to hear more about climate change, make sure you stay tuned into us because Zach and I are going to have another conversation that's touching more on climate change in the Midwest. I wish we could go on. I feel like I could write <laughs> 10 more questions here, but I'm sure. going to wrap it up. Zach, thank you so much for giving me your time. Yeah, thank you so much. It, it was a pleasure to be here. And I think we had a really good conversation. So awesome. All right. Until we meet again. All right. Sounds good. Thanks for stopping by the search bar. Make sure that you like and subscribe so that you never have to search for another episode.